Howdy, um, I'm Don Williams and I'm out here living the dream in the hinterlands of the mountains of Virginia. I'm hoping this is the last chilly day of winter, but uh, been out here for a few years now and behind me you can see the barn on White Run, sometimes just called Don's Barn. And it's a building that I found on eBay several years ago out in Quincy, Illinois. And we had it dismantled and moved here and erected late in 2007. And been working on it for the last 10 years uh, to get it to where I would have a workable shop space inside and a classroom and hopefully eventually a library and a meeting hall upstairs. But with a project like this, people say, well, when are you going to be done with it? And I say, well, not until after I'm dead and I figure out what to do with it. But it's a lifetime's work and it's a lifetime's dream. I spent about 40 years trying to structure my life and have a place like this, and I finally got it. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's somewhere where I spend my days now after retiring from the Smithsonian after almost 30 years. I used to be the senior furniture conservator there. Now I spend my days out here sort of divided up amongst a whole lot of things that I do, sometimes just following my whims at uh, replicating historical craft technology or working with new material science or even writing books. Just enough to keep me busier than I ever was when I had a job, but uh, it's, it's something that I love to do. I'm out here almost every day and uh, can't wipe the smile off my face. It's just a, a dream come true for me. So in a minute we'll go inside and you can see the sorts of things that I occupy my time with and uh, it might amuse you, it might uh, encourage you, but one thing is for sure, it's not going to be a, a sterile, stylish, tidy workshop. That's not what it's like on the inside. It's a barn on the outside and a working wood shop on the inside. So, uh, you know, take it for what it is and hope that you enjoy the tour inside. Well, this is the main floor of my Fortress of Solitude in the barn, which uh, is a pretty good sized building. It's 40 by 36 by four and a half stories and completely off grid. So I generate all my own electricity between solar panels and a hydroelectric plant for this. So I sometimes have to use some judgment in what I'm doing in any particular day. If I'm using a lot of electricity, I have to wait for a good sunny day with good water flowing. But here in the center, I've got uh, my table saw, a couple of band saws, uh, obviously a couple of lathes here and um, this time of year when it's really cold and I don't heat this part of the building, I get in and out of here as quickly as I can. But otherwise, um, I use the space as I need to for when I'm doing uh, handling big, big material, big stock. I do it out here so I can get it taken care of and move it into my shop, which is uh, right behind uh, that wall over there, which is really the only space I keep heated in the barn or in the classroom behind me here, which I don't heat, which means I only have workshops here in the summertime because not too many people want to come dressed in uh, parkas and overall car, car hearts to work uh, at the bench. So uh, that's where we're going to go next and then finish up in some spaces across uh, the building. Very simple room here that is currently set up basically just to hold stuff because it's the dead of winter and I'm not doing any workshops out here until May where we'll be building a ripple molding cutter, uh, which could be a lot of fun. But I have a series of workbenches that I either acquired or made. I actually made most of the benches in here so that everybody can have their own workbench when we're uh, doing workshops. and. Um, not much more to say about that. I have some of my tools that I've acquired, you know, the circa 1800 four foot uh, length veneer saw there, which is a really sweet machine that can do pretty amazing work. I, I used it just a couple weeks ago and it's best to have two people work it, but 
one person can control it, but you just can't work fast because uh, you'll you'll burn out pretty quick uh, when you're at it. I'm actually set up to do some photography now for a an article that I'm writing for Pop Wood, um, which will come out I think sometime this summer. So um, just doing some still shots on that. Uh, behind me here, or right next to me, this is a project we'll be looking at a little bit later. It's a replica of a circa 1820 desk. And I had pictures and some measurements and some knowledge, but I wasn't entirely sure of some of the proportional details. So I built a full-scale uh, mock-up of, of the, uh, the desk so that I could make sure I had all the details right when I, when I finally made it out of mahogany uh, for a, a client who commissioned me to make that. So that's always a good thing. I'm not, I'm not a furniture maker per se. I do some furniture making, but I've done more restoration. Uh, being a conservator at the Smithsonian for almost 30 years, you see a lot of stuff. And then I was in the commercial world before that doing restoration. So I don't make a lot of furniture. I restore some. And mostly I'm just out here pursuing my own whimsical curiosities about the way things were done in the past and maybe the way things will be done in the future. So uh, I have back in the back underneath that furniture pad a, uh, a classical sh mar marquetry Chevrolet, which I use on occasion. But uh, that's just sort of where we're at. Uh, in that regard, I don't use it a lot. It's not a tool that I am comfortable with because I just don't have enough time sitting on it. But this is, for example, uh, getting on to other things that I'm interested in. These are some paste wax formulations that I work on. One of the things that I'm really passionate about is historical finishing. And so I spent a lot of my time exploring and replicating to the best of my knowledge and inference the way things were done in the past. And it's been interesting to learn and experience how much more widespread use wax was as a finish back in the old days. And I'm working a bunch of formulations, including some products that I'll tell you about in a little bit, where we've uh, patented the essentially the perfect furniture wax, as far as I can tell. So we'll, we'll go over to where I'm, I've actually got some beeswax that's in process right now. I buy raw beeswax. And I'll show you over on the other side of the, uh, the building how I process it from pretty dirty stuff, completely full of uh, honey residue and bee parts to end up with some stuff that's really quite, quite golden clear. And we uh, provide that for sale both in blocks. And then I'll be mixing up a bunch more uh, finish and furniture polish products from that ourselves. So we'll, we'll head across the way and see that. One of the things that's often true about a lot of people when they're doing finishing is that they forget to make sample boards. So I, I actually buy full sheets of plywood and cut them up and to make sample boards out of them. And you can see that I've written a number on that. Well, I, I have a, a notebook and I actually write the numbers and the description of the process on this. So at any time in the past, I can go back and look at a sample board and say, OK, I want to look and see what board number 12 of a particular lot or experiment was. And I can look and see precisely what it was I used, how I did it, and then I can judge it to see how it's holding up over time. And this is uh, just some really good advice for those of you that are, are not entirely comfortable with the finishing process. I, I can't identify with that because it, I think it's just entirely natural. Uh, but I know a lot of woodworkers are intimidated by finishing, so make lots of sample boards. Mark them, and this is this is a sample board that isn't marked because it hasn't been taken to its final uh, final point yet. So uh, just do it. It's a it's cheap insurance and it's a cheap reminder because I could try as I might, I I would work hard to remember how I did things over time, but uh, the odds are pretty good that I wouldn't remember what I did over, given enough time. So on this one, I actually have written on the back what I've done on that. So. That's uh, so just a really good clue for those of you that are um, not entirely comfortable with finishing or striking out into new areas 
with finishing. Make sample boards and then write on them or mark on them or record in some way exactly what you did so that you can go back and either replicate if you really like the results or avoid it if you don't like the results. So just a good rule of thumb is uh, always write it down. If you're interested in learning traditional woodworking with hand tools, visit my website at woodandshop.com where you can find free video tutorials, buying guides, and reviews. Make sure you subscribe to my regular blog posts and also check out my 10 steps for getting started. Enjoy!